welcome back. My name is Teresa. I'm a surface pattern designer and watercolor artist if you've never been here before. Today I am going to show you how to take a very complicated frilly flower that you probably think you can't paint and turn it into a very easy, loose, beautiful floral painting that you absolutely can paint. And the first step is to get to know the flower just a little bit so that we can simplify it. So let's take a look. In case you're not familiar with this flower, this is a crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtles come in both trees and bushes and usually grow in warmer climates. So what I want you to notice is the bloom is really a cluster of blooms rather than a single flower. And this is what was overwhelming to me the first time I tried to paint this flower because I just didn't know what to do with all these little blooms that pop out of each pod. And then each one has multiple blooms, but then it has one stamen. The stamen's usually a yellowy color with some little filaments coming off of it. And the pod can be green with some little pink touches too. But this was a lot of detail that it can be pretty overwhelming. So we're just going to keep it very, very simple. Let's notice the leaves, they're, they're just smooth, basic, smooth, rounded leaves, so that's not going to be complicated either. And then I took this picture that I really love. I like how it comes from the side and into the middle of the, the paint, or the, not the painting, but the picture. So we're going to go with something like that. And if you really look at this flower, it's very detailed, lots and lots of information, but we're not going to worry about that. The main thing I wanted you to take from this is the frilliness and the colors. So here are the colors that I chose and I'll put those all down below because there are a couple of mixes in here. So let's get our composition game plan. The first bloom should be about right here. This will be our, our showcase spot and then we'll have some up top and maybe some down at this left corner. And I usually like to work in threes. But, you know, we're just going to kind of leave that open. We'll start with three branches coming across and then we'll just fill in where we need it if we have too much white space. And I'm going to bring mine in coming from the left to the right. Maybe that's because I'm right-handed or we read right, left to right. I'm not sure, but that's, that's just usually the way I like to approach it is to have the heavier side on the left. Now I'm going to start out with just a little watery wash to lay down some background petals for our, our focal bloom. I'm using a size 8 quill brush so I can cover more ground quickly. And I'm just going to mimic some little frilly motions to outline the overall bloom cluster. Not getting too detailed about it, we're just we're just trying to get a little feel for where we, we want this bloom and how big we want it to be. And when I feel good about where it is, then I'm going to add some darker, less watery, water, watery, <laughs> less watery pigment. And I'm going kind of slow at first, just to let the bloom start to materialize. Get a good mental picture for where I'm going on this page. And it may be helpful to sketch out the composition on the paper first. In fact, I think that's what most people really do. But for some reason, I just really love to get things and let them happen on the paper as I go. Well, not always. Just when I'm painting in this really loose style. But that's just my personal quirkiness. I just love the spontaneity of working with a general idea in my head and then altering it in real time as I go, as I see things happen. But the most important thing is for you to do it however you are the most comfortable and confident. I cannot overstress that. I've added in some of those little bloom pods here, and I'm not getting too detailed with that. I'm just laying down some color to represent them. I 
Now my first pass with the leaves, I'm using a mixture of sap and green gold. And then I'm going to go back and drop in just straight green gold and then sometimes some straight just sap, just so we can have some tonal variances in our leaves. And be sure to allow the greens and the pinks to touch so that they'll give us that really lovely watercolor blending. In loose watercolors, you always want to encourage different colors to merge by touching them in spots here and there. If you keep all the pinks together and then all the greens together without any merging, we'll lose that gorgeous watercolor personality. And this is a great time to drop in an unexpected color. I noticed in our reference photo that the greens really had some blue undertones. So I am going to add in a blue color here just to give us a pop of interest that's unexpected. And this blue is really going to pop on this green. Notice I'm not covering the whole leaf with the blue. I don't want to change the colors of the green leaves. I just want to add some other tones to the greens. And I'll also touch it to the pinks as well, just to spread that color out a little bit and make everything go together well. And same thing with the browns. I selected two browns that go well together, kind of a lighter to medium brown, a Van Dyke brown, kind of watery, and then also a little mixture that I made up with some sepia to give it a little shadow and extra texture. And again, same thing like with the pinks and the greens and the blues, I want to allow that brown to seep into the other colors. It just makes your whole painting more harmonious. Now we'll put the upper branch in and it doesn't matter if you do the branch part first or the bloom part first just whatever you feel like doing is fine started out a little dark with this one but that doesn't matter we can add a little water to it and thin it out I'm going to be going over all of this anyway to get different layers of tones with this pinky purple I've mixed up so it doesn't matter and you may not could tell it but I'm cleaning my brush periodically and then wiping it off on a towel. Not completely, but mostly. Because this is a quill brush, it is going to hold a lot of moisture in the belly. So then after I dab it off, I'm taking the tip and dipping it into the pigment. And then as I'm making these strokes on the paper, I'm allowing the belly of that brush to touch the paper as well. And that's what's making these blooms look so, so soft and feathery. The moisture from the belly is helping that pigment spread. And you can make these blooms more individually distinguishable if you want, but I'm going to keep mine super loose in general. And now that you have the gist of my process, I'm going to speed this up and let you watch the rest of it in peace without me talking the whole time. And then when we get to the inking portion, we'll talk more about that.
Okay, I'm pretty satisfied with this. I could stop here and not add any ink details at all. That's always a hard decision for me, but with this one, I think the ink will add another dimension that will elevate the painting just a bit. So I'm going to use my blue pumpkin nib, which I use quite often when I'm not using a, a brush pen. And I really like Winsor Newton peat brown, but I'm all out of that. So I'm going to mix one up using this Ecoline 411 Burnt Sienna plus this Sepia. So I'm using six drops of the sepia and about a teaspoon of the burnt sienna and I've put it in this little cap just so I can really dip my pen in it well. But truth be told, the eco line inks are fairly thin, which is great sometimes, but with this blue pumpkin nib, sometimes it, it runs out very quickly. I'm hoping that the sepia since it's thicker will help with that but we'll just see so be sure to start at the top and work your way down so that you don't put your hand in the wet ink and ink takes a little longer to dry so i do it a lot so i try to force myself to start at the top and work down and don't go back but we'll see <laughs> what happens and all we're going to do is draw in little details here and there how much or how little is totally up to you so I just like to start and just see how it goes and I'll know when I'm done, you know? So I'm just mimicking some little frilliness at the ends of these little petals and I'm not doing every one and I'm not even doing each one at the end of a little paint spot. Sometimes I'm doing it in the middle of a paint spot to indicate other leaves that are separate, if that makes sense. I'll also draw in some extra elements, like I'm drawing in one of these pods and there's really no ink there. And I'll do some leaves like that as well, just because I think that's a nice surprise. And I drew in a few stamens a moment ago, right up here, and I really don't like the way that looks. so. I'm just gonna sit on that for a minute. I don't think I may come back and do something else with that because I really don't like the way that turned out. I let this dry overnight because ink needs some extra time for all those wonderfully blobby parts to get good and dry all the way through. I've ruined <laughs> so many ink detailed paintings by handling them too soon. So I've just found that overnight is a good safe zone for me. And overnight lets me step away from it for a while and then come back with fresh eyes for one last look before I take the tape off. Sometimes I'll see a hole or some other little something I want to fix or add that I didn't see the day before. But I'm pretty happy with this, so I'm calling this one done. Well, I hope you had as much fun with that one as I did. I hope you try it. I have complete confidence that you can do this. Really, you really can. 
but if you have problems or you have questions, just pop them in the comments below and I'll get right back to you and help you out. If you enjoyed this one, please give me a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, please consider subscribing. It really does help my channel. And both of those things help YouTube know that you enjoyed this content so other people just like you may also enjoy it. Thanks for watching.